Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, I post videos pertaining to a little bit of whatever I want. Conspiracy theories, controversial people, true crime, vlogs, and so if you're interested in any of that, you can subscribe and if not, totally chill. We are just here to do some makeup, talk about true crime, and let me tell you this story. There is a lot to get through, so we are just gonna hop right into it. But before getting to the rest of today's video, I do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, Babbel. Now, if you guys don't know what Babbel is, Babbel is your new language learning best friend that offers tons of different languages for you to learn, like Spanish, Polish, German, Danish, French. Lessons are super quick, 10 minutes long, and helps you learning a brand new language in as little as three weeks. Now, as some of you may or may not know, I love French music. I think French music, especially when I'm playing it in the morning when I'm getting ready, is just so relaxing but since I listen to a lot of French music I don't really know what they're saying so because of that I've been using Babbel to help me with my French skills like je m'appelle Haley and also with Babbel you are being taught these languages by actual teachers not some you know like automated AI like they teach you things that you're actually going to use in conversations and Babbel also understands that a lot of people have different learning preferences so that's why they have podcasts if you're an auditory listener, games if you're more hands-on, as well as live classes if you're more visual. So whether you're planning to study abroad, dreaming of a future travel, or simply, you know, just have that itch or that urge to learn something new, Babbel is the best place to start. And Babbel is currently giving away every single one of you guys 60% off your Babbel subscription if you click the link down below or just simply scan this little QR code right here. Babbel is actually so, so helpful and it's definitely become a part of my everyday routine and I just feel so productive when I'm using Babbel because I'm like learning a new language, I'm learning a new skill and if you guys want 60% off your Babbel subscription, make sure to click the link down below or scan this little QR code right here. And thank you once again to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. Now back to your video. Sherry Grafe was born on June 11th, 1982 in Shasta Lake, California. California. She grew up with her mother Loretta, her father Richard, and her sister Sheila. Sherry was described to be as that stereotypical pretty girl in high school. She ran um, for her school's track team. She also grew up in a very religious family and even her herself was very religious. Like she would go to church every Sunday. She would go to Friday night worship. Her whole family was basically like that typical white picket fence sort of family. But although she did have this like seemingly perfect lifestyle, Sherry was definitely the troublemaker at school and outside of school. She would typically use her looks to have everybody believe whatever she was saying and also if she was ever like caught by the police, she was typically able to get out of it. Unfortunately, her behavior continued even after high school because in the year 2000 at 18 years old, Sherry's father Richard had actually called the police on Sherry saying that Sherry and him had gotten into a really bad argument to which Sherry had basically trashed his home, their home. She started throwing things, she was stealing things, she was breaking things to the point where Richard had to actually call the police to control the situation. There was also another incident where Sherry's sister Sheila had also called the police on Sherry saying that Sherry and her had had gotten into a pretty bad argument that day and then when she came home from work she saw that her back door had been broken into. She assumed that this was Sherry because when she looked inside like nothing was stolen, nothing was gone. And then in 2001 at the age of 19 years old that is when Sherry would meet a man by the name of James Reyes. Now they actually met at a Friday night um, youth program like at their church but this relationship would be extremely short-lived. James would describe Sherry to be a very attention-hungry person. She was constantly lying about the smallest of things and even would create these like outlandish stories that would make absolutely no sense but then just expect everybody to believe her. Due to all of this, the couple broke up and their relationship really wasn't that long 
but although they broke up, they still kept in contact over the years. And then in 2002, when Sherry was 20 years old, she actually started to date a 15-year-old boy by the name of Sean Davari, and Sean actually worked as a youth counselor at like this church camp that they were attending, um, and for obvious reasons, 20 years old and 15 years old, this relationship was very short-lived. People who worked at the church uh, described Sherry to be extremely problematic. She was always lying again about like little things, about big things, and she would also create all these outlandish stories about her fellow employees. And then in 2003, when Sherry was 21 years old, that is when her father Richard started to notice some really odd charges being taken out of his account. So when he called the bank, it turns out that Sherry had actually been taking money out of her father's account. When Richard had confronted Sherry about this situation, Sherry actually started to harm herself. Like she would give herself bruises and scratches. And every time her mom Loretta didn't do what Sherry told her to do, Sherry always threatened that she was going to go to the police and tell the police that her mom actually created all of these scratches and bruises on her. But she ended up actually calling the police on Sherry, telling them the whole situation. And then due to this, Sherry wasn't really given any consequence. She just kind of stopped. In the year 2006, at the age of 24 years old, that is when Sherry would meet a man by the name of David Dreyfus. And David and her met and got married very quickly after meeting. Whilst they were married, that is when Sherry started to reconnect with her childhood crush, 23-year-old Keith Papini. Keith Papini was actually Sherry's very first kiss in seventh grade. It was said that whilst they started talking, Sherry was actually cheating on David with Keith. It was said that on their first date, on Sherry and Keith's first date, Keith had actually brought all of like the little notes that they would pass to one another when they were in class in seventh grade and he's kept them all these years because he secretly has always had a crush on her. And then in 2008 at the age of 26 years old that is when Sherry would divorce David and then right after start dating Keith and her and Keith actually got married the year after in 2009. The couple shortly after getting married moved into David's childhood home in Mountain Lake, California and then a few years after moving in with one another, that is when they would go on to have their very first child and it was a son and for privacy reasons, we're gonna call him Brandon. And then two years later after that, they had a daughter and for privacy reasons, we're gonna call her Olivia. I feel like in cases like these, especially when you're dealing with very, very young children, both of these kids were under the age of 10 years old when all of this was going on. And I feel like it's just not fair to the kids that have to like grow up having their name attached to their mom and like all the terrible things that she did and I don't think that's fair if they you know when they're older want to come out and talk about their story of their mother then that is their choice but as for now they're just children let them be children let them have their childhood and the family seems like a super happy family Keith actually worked a full-time job at Best Buy while Sherry was a stay at home mom. They would go on family trips. They were very loved in the neighborhood. And even Sherry's sister, Sheila, actually said that, you know, Sherry used to have a very long history of violent outbursts. She was always acting out. But Sheila said that right after Sherry had kids, it was like a switch happened. She became like the most mothering and nurturing person. She was a great mother. She put her kids before anything else. She was just overall a lot more more of an enjoyable person to be around. And I mean, vice versa for Keith. Keith absolutely loved Sherry and he also absolutely loved their kids. His favorite thing to do was just spend time with his family at the beach. And so again, from the outside, it seemed like this family was the perfect family, but unfortunately on the inside, it was not as pretty as it seemed. Sherry was a stay at home mom. And so when she was home alone, alone all day with no kids or with no husband, it left her a lot of time 
to, you know, sit and think a lot of time for herself. And that is when she started to reconnect with her ex-boyfriend, James Reyes. And the two of them started talking more and more. And then on November 2nd of 2016, Sherry and James were speaking over text. And that is when Sherry and James had made plans to hang out with one another that day. But it was actually this day of November 2nd that would mark the day that would start all of the craziness and madness that would last over years and years to come. Keith said that on this day, November 2nd, 2016, he had come home from work and typically when he comes home from work, he's greeted by Sherry and the kids because this is around the time where Sherry and the kids would be home. But he said that on this specific day, he came home from work and nobody was home. Typically, the kids would be picked up from daycare between 4.30 and 4.45 and at this point, it was only five o'clock. Not that much time has passed. He's assuming they probably went to the store or got something to eat. As it got later and later, Sherry and the kids never showed up. And so he looked at his text that he had with Sherry just to see like maybe he missed something. And he saw that the last text he received from Sherry was at 10.37 a.m. And it said, quote, would you be home for lunch? He replied at 1.30 saying, quote, sorry, long day. So Keith again assumes that, okay, maybe they went out to eat afterwards. As time goes on, Keith starts to get extremely worried. So he actually tries to call Sherry to which Sherry is not picking up. And this is when the worry really starts to set in for Keith. He immediately calls the daycare that his kids are staying at just to ask, you know, hey what time did Sherry pick up the kids and the daycare actually told Keith Sherry never came to pick up the kids the kids are actually still here immediately when he hears that he starts panicking he starts freaking out so he doesn't call anyone right away he actually goes to this like specific forest preserve that um, Sherry would frequently run on like it was like her usual trail when he's looking through he notices something lying on the grass and when he he gets closer, he realizes that it was actually Sherry's cell phone with Sherry's hair intertwined in her headphones. So as soon as Keith sees this, he immediately calls the police. So uh, I just got home from work and uh, my wife wasn't there, which is unusual. And my kids should have been there by now from like daycare. So I was like, oh, maybe she went on a walk. Um, I couldn't find her. So I called the, the daycare to see what time she picked up the kids. The kids were never picked up. So I got freaked out, so I hit, like, the Find My iPhone app thing. And it said that her, it showed her phone, like, at our end of our driveway. We don't have really good service. Okay. Uh, not the end of our driveway, but the end of our street. So I just drove down there, and I saw her phone with her headphones because she started running again. And it, her, I found her phone, and it's got, like, hair ripped out of it, like, in the headphones. So I'm, like, totally freaking out, thinking, like, somebody, okay, like, what's just her? grabbed her. You're telling me that something happened to her is the way I'm looking at it. There's, like, then there was hair, like, in the headphones. Like, it got ripped off of, like, the ground. Yeah, no, I, un I understand. I understand. Okay, I'm sorry. I know okay. you're trying to keep me calm. Keith calls his mother, tells his mother to pick up the kids, and whilst he's waiting on the police, he actually starts interviewing a bunch of the neighbors that lived nearby the forest preserve. Did you see this woman? Where did you see her at? What time did you see her at? One neighbor in particular actually said that he saw Sherry jogging in her bright pink Nike, like, hoodie jacket that she was always wearing and he saw her jogging in that area around 2 p.m. but after that he hasn't seen her since. This was also a very like quiet town. It's very small. It's very quaint and so if Sherry like were to be in danger of any kind and she were to scream you would definitely hear it but the fact that no neighbors had heard anything or seen anything suspicious was in and itself suspicious. But nonetheless this story absolutely blew up and I think it was mostly because of Keith and his really hard efforts to find Sherry. Due to this, it actually started to make national news. There were volunteer efforts, search and rescue teams, dogs, helicopters, all over the forest area and all over the neighborhood in general. But even after all of those efforts, the police could not find a single thing. Over 20 different 
different search warrants were issued and again none of them led anywhere not even is this situation really hard on keith but it's also really hard on sherry's children where your wife goes missing your kids are going to ask questions where's mommy where did she go and that's a really really tough conversation to have with your kids but keith pursued and he started speaking with all media outlets mostly because the media just moves so quick you know like one minute something's a really hot topic and then the next minute it's like yesterday's news and no one's really talking about it so keith was just trying to talk to as many people as possible because he didn't want to lose momentum or lose people's attention he wanted to make sure that everybody was actively looking for her because he just desperately wanted her home sherry's sister sheila also spoke to the news outlets she's very bubbly um friendly um has a great smile um absolutely loves her children would do anything for them she's an incredible human being best mom i've ever seen <laughs> i mean her her children if you met her children you just they're incredible they're incredible because she's such a great mom she's so hands-on she's she really is the best mom i've ever seen it's amazing it's annoying because she's so amazing <laughs> we call her super mom you just want to find her just bring sherry home on top of all of the search efforts and media appearances, a GoFundMe was also made in to help aid in the search for Sherry, to which this GoFundMe had actually made over $56,000 thousand dollars due to all of this you know intense media attention it actually caught the attention of an anonymous person who reached out to keith saying he wanted to be anonymous but he also wanted to help so this anonymous person decided to donate fifty thousand dollars so that he could go on the news and tell whoever had kidnapped sherry to bring her home and if they do so they will receive fifty thousand dollars Bring her home. Bring her home. Just bring her home. Bring her home safe. There's a $50,000 reward. Bring her home. And this is actually called a reverse ransom, and it's very commonly used in missing persons cases. But when Keith brought this idea over to the police, the police said that it actually wasn't a good idea that the person was remaining anonymous because it could make the reward seem non existent because there's not a face attached to it. So that is when they decided to try to find a face to attach to this random $50,000 reward, and that is when. When they found a man by the name of Cameron Gamble. He was a hostage negotiator. He had many, many years of experience in situations like these from all over the world. So Cameron was very qualified to be the face of this reward. And Cameron's wife even encouraged Cameron to do this because she knows that if she was kidnapped, she would want someone like Cameron to help her out of her situation. So that is exactly what Cameron did. He went to the news and he told the kidnappers wherever they were to bring Sherry home safely and if they did there would be a $50,000 reward waiting for them and they were expecting to get some sort of something but unfortunately when this happened nothing came from it and so when there was no leads or action being taken that is when they decided to crank things up a little bit and make the reward a hundred thousand dollars instead of fifty thousand and even then there was absolutely no real leads nobody came forward with sherry since the police were kind of reaching all of these dead ends that is when they had really no choice but to start questioning people and the first person that they questioned was keith sometimes you have situations where the husband is actually responsible or the husband kills the wife but keith actually passed not only a lie detector test but he also had an alibi the people that he was working working with, Keith was cleared. Unfortunately, the police kept on hitting more and more dead ends. They really had no choice but to slow down the investigation. They really had nothing to go off of. So on the morning of Thanksgiving of 2016, Keith had actually planned a balloon release at like a nearby park in hopes of, you know, maybe Sherry will see one and she'll know that we're looking for her. But what Keith didn't know was that on the other side of town, 
about two hours away in Yolo County, California, at around 4 a.m., a woman by the name of Allison Sutton was driving along this road with her daughter, and she spots a blonde woman on the side of the road. She looks disheveled, she looks terrified, she's screaming for help, and at first, Allison kind of kept her distance because she didn't know if this was a real person in real need of help or if this was some sort of trap. So she kept her distance, but she called the police. And while she called the police, there was a trucker that came by and also stopped on the side of the road. But he actually got out of the car and talked to Sherry and he was on the phone with the police. Hey, what are you reporting? Hi, I have an emergency. There is a lady on the side of the road needing help. Do you know what's wrong with her? She is saying that she got kicked out of her boyfriend's. No. Okay, just just be safe where you are. What what is she asking for? She's chained up. Her vision blurry and she needs an ambulance. Do you see her chained up? Yes. Yeah. Her name is Sherry Panini. Can I talk to her? Here. <laughs> Sherry, I need you to listen to me. Listen to me. Do you know where you are? No. No. I've been in the car. Okay, take a deep breath, sweetie. Who chained you up? You know the person or were you kidnapped? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, listen. Listen, I have help on the way. The police immediately show up and they do confirm that this is indeed Sherry Papini. They take her straight to the hospital and Keith gets a call that Sherry is found and she's in the hospital and Keith is just over the moon. He is relieved because at this point, Sherry had been kidnapped for 22 days. Those 22 days probably felt like 22 years to Keith. And the fact that Sherry is finally home and safe, like his heart was probably just so full just to see Sherry by his side again. But unfortunately, Sherry was not in the best of shape when she was discovered. She was covered in blood and bruises. She had broken chains chains still around her wrists and ankles. She was wearing super baggy clothing. There was clearly a lot of health concerns with Sherry. She had lost 15% of her body fat because she was extremely malnourished. She actually only weighed at 87 pounds. The bridge of her nose was broken. She had bruises and cuts all over her body. She actually had the word exodus imprinted on her back branded her and her poor face I got like nauseated just looking at her it was so hard for me to see her like that and bruises were just intense the bumps from you know being hit and kicked and whatever else. When Sherry first got to the hospital, she was actually pretty collaborative with the police, but she couldn't really remember big things like her captivity or her captors, which is completely normal because when something like this is so fresh in your head, your brain's automatic response is to either trauma block or try to protect you from the goriest parts. And so the fact that she couldn't remember right away was a completely normal response to the trauma that she had endured endured for 22 days. But one thing that the doctors kind of found a little odd, she had said that while she was escaping, she actually hurt her foot extremely bad. But when the doctors had ran tests on Sherry's foot, they found nothing wrong with Sherry's foot. And then the doctors also made note that all of the bruises on her body were at different stages of the healing process. So it inferred that these bruises were made not all at once, but over a long period of time. Police also decided decided to perform tests on her to try to find some sort of DNA. And they did find one male DNA and one female DNA, but they were unable to get an exact match to who these two people were. With, you know, something like this, the police obviously want to find the person. So whenever they're asking Sherry questions about, you know, what did her kidnappers look like? What was her environment? And they weren't being too aggressive with her or anything. They understood her situation. But Sherry, weirdly, wasn't, you know, not cooperative. She was actually very mean to officers and she would scream at them and yell at them. I can't imagine what you've been through. We don't know how this happened. 
I don't know. No one can protect me. I just want my husband. No one found me. I want my husband. And they tell Keith, okay, we're going to bug you and you're going to go in there and try to get some sort of something from her. Like, we're not trying to do anything malicious. We're just trying to find the kidnappers and we know that she's not going to talk to us, but maybe she'll be able to talk to you. Keith goes into the hospital room and that is when Sherry started to open up a little bit to Keith about what happened. The reason why she didn't want to talk to the police about what happened is because her kidnappers, her captors, actually told her that she was going to be sold to a police officer and she was going to be put into this sex trafficking ring and if she were to tell the police anything, the police would work against her and put her in jail. So that is the most Sherry says about the situation. She goes no further than that, which is very understandable. I mean, when something like this happens to you, the first thing you want to do is just not talk about it. You want to pretend that it never happened happened. And also her physical and mental state as well was probably not good enough to be interrogated about something like this. She was, again, extremely malnourished. She was very weak. She was very sleep deprived. Four days later, when Sherry was released from the hospital, that is when she agreed with the police to sit down and do a full interview of what happened that day. I'll leave the entire interrogation, the entire video down below. It's about two hours long, but it is quite the ride. Obviously, I'm not going to make you sit down and watch an entire two-hour interrogation, so I'm just going to give you the main ideas of what happened. Sherry said that on the day of November 2nd, while her kids was at daycare and Keith was at work, she decided to go out for a run. She says that on her jog, there was a car that pulled up next to her, and she didn't really know what was going on at first until the back door of the car had been opened, and in the back seat of the car was two Hispanic women, one of them with a gun pointed towards her. Literally anybody in that situation, if you're jogging somewhere and a random car like slows down and pulls up next to you, that's a very scary situation. I'm going to show you the clip of when Sherry is talking about this and I want you to notice how quick her demeanor changes from crying to normal. Is the car on sunrise right now or is it still on the no. old Oregon Trail? It's on, it's on Old Oregon Trail. Okay. How far away do you think you are when, when that happened? Um, when what, what are you asking? When the car stops. Um, do you know how, about how close were you? Which time? It stopped twice. Once when it went past the street sign, once when it backed up. Which time were you asking? Both. I can't remember if she said, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to kill you. I can't remember exactly if it's we don't want to something. We don't want to something. We don't want to something. And then I put my phone down. And as soon as I put it down, I was so mad because I couldn't call my husband. I can't remember. I can't remember lifting my leg. I can't remember the back door open. At this point, Sherry was dragged out to the car and to this, Sherry doesn't really remember too much, but she does think at some point she was actually tased. If this is close in front of me, I can feel that. I can feel that that's close. Mm -hmm. So if I lift my head, I, can, I know that there's, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. My head's down. There's something here. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense yes. to you? Mm -hmm. um, Sherry then goes on to say that the two women had put a bag over her head so she couldn't really know where they were going. When they reached to the destination, she was brought into this house and in this house, she was brought into a room that was very small, very cold, very dirty. And it was in this room that for the next 22 days, every single day, Sherry would be beat and tortured and shackled and starved and, quote, forced to listen to annoying mariachi music. Kind of weird that you put 
listening to mariachi music and being starved and beaten in the same category. But anyway, Sherry continues. She said that since the room was super dark, she couldn't really see anything, but she could hear things that were going outside of the room. She heard a TV playing very loudly. There was also points where she smelled smoke, but not smoke that came from like cigars or cigarettes. It was smoke that came from a fireplace or a grill. She said that all they gave her to eat was rice, a tortilla, and sometimes an apple. She said that during her captivity, she missed her kids so much to the point where she would take rolled up pieces of cloth and hold them in her arms that's not how you hold a baby, holds them in her arms like this as if it were her children because she just missed her children so much. She says her days for the next 22 days consisted of just getting abused and beat and every time she made a noise or tried to escape she would get beaten even more. I know obviously this is a very like sensitive situation. We're dealing with very sensitive subjects and it should be dealt with respect and compassion but the way that that Sherry explains it. For someone who for 22 days was tortured and beaten and starved and then four days after she finally gets home she does an interview talking about all that trauma that is still so fresh in her mind but the way she talks about it is just so nonchalant and casual. There was a lot of other things and I know that you guys know Yeah. That's embarrassing and well, and yucky and that's weird for me. That's weird for me. This is very weird for me. Yeah. Because I know that you know yeah, everything no about everything and that's... Well, and, the, and I know Keith... Awkward. Know, we all know what we're talking about. That's the best way to and say those that. Are some that's very we, awkward for me. Well, I, I, I get it. So before all of this, I watched those shows. Mm -hmm. I watched those shows and I, you know, and I've read Elizabeth Smart's book. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I was the weird stay at home mom that watched the like, you know, random, mm -hmm. what are those shows called? Uh, True crime story. Yeah. I watched all that stuff. So I, um, like I'm thinking about <laughs> that now where I'm like, oh my God, someone is going to be on her side defending her against all of this crap. And because I watched those shows. She goes on to say that the two women had told her that she was going to be sold into a sex trafficking ring that they were the leaders of and that she was going to be sold to a police officer specifically and the police officer requested that she be branded with the word exodus on her back. They found the word exodus burned on her back. Sherry couldn't have done that to herself. So again, this proves more credibility to her story. She even goes on to say that at one point she got so desperate to where she tried to manipulate her captors. Started this rash mm -hmm. um, that's up in here. Mm -hmm. This, it was starting to like swell, mm -hmm. starting to swell so bad that it was like putting pressure on my arm. So I was trying to um, manipulate them. I need some kind of medicine, like look at my skin you need to wash me, you need to give me medicine, you need to get me something. Um, and I was using that and it was so itchy. Um, so they would argue about washing my clothes. And I was able to take two, I wanna say two showers. Um, they weren't really, if you wanna call them a shower, it was get in, rinse water down your back and get out. Um, but she let me wash my underpants. So you're probably wondering how did Sherry escape? She said that on the day she had escaped, she actually heard a conversation going on in the next room, but they were speaking Spanish, so she couldn't really understand what they were saying. She says that the argument got super loud and super bad, and then all of a sudden she just heard a gunshot. And then a couple hours later, the two women that had kidnapped her from before 
came into the room and put a bag over her head and put her into a car. She said that during this car ride, she was so malnourished and sleep deprived to the point where she couldn't even remember what the car ride was like. She was constantly going in and out of consciousness, which again, makes complete sense. You know, if you're malnourished and you're weak, you're not going to be awake and alert. She says that all of a sudden the car stops and when the car stops, Sherry is let go from the truck and then her bag is taken off from her head and immediately when the bag is taken off from her head that is when Sherry continues to just run for her life. She, there's even footage of her running through a parking lot and that is when she was discovered by Allison and the trucker. When the interviewers asked Sherry you know how did it feel when you were finally released like what did you see what did you feel she said that she was happy that she was home but she was also frustrated. She has been tortured, beaten, sleep deprived, very weak, has like no idea what time it is, what day it is, yet she still says that although she was happy to be home, she was extremely frustrated because the police wouldn't take the zip ties off of her wrists. And to this, she starts making jokes while talking about it very angry and I was very frustrated because when they first pulled up, I asked them multiple times to cut off the zip tie because my hand was like turning blue. Like my hand, it was cut off and they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And that was very frustrating to me that no one would cut it off. And I was telling her that. And I said, you know, they wouldn't let me talk to my husband. I want my husband. And they weren't even untying me. And he said, we did untie you. And I was like, get the <laughs> no, you didn't! Because he yelled back at me like we did, and I'm like, no, you didn't. Um, and How long did yeah. it take you to get there as opposed to everything else? Yeah, no, so I just was very... Even during this interrogation, when the police were trying to get more information from her, they were trying to ask, you know, what did your captors look like? She actually never gave a description to what they looked like until a year later. Even after this interview, this two hour long interview, she never spoke to the police about anything. She never went to the media about anything. She basically just went about her life per usual. A year later, she did indeed give the descriptions to the police and she described the two women to be Hispanic women, one of them younger with curly hair, brown eyes, and hoop earrings, while the other one was a little bit older, also with long hair, and the two of them were wearing masks. And so this description was indeed released out into the public and they were also giving out a $10,000 reward for anybody who had any information on who these two people were. A lot of people, specifically Hispanic women, were called into the police station on accounts that they were going to be charged with kidnapping. Thank God no one got arrested. No one was actually charged with the crime. They were basically just interviewed and interrogated, but all of them had either passed a polygraph test or had a really good alibi. So all of them were cleared and the police were still left with little to no leads as to who these two people were. Between the years of 2016 and 2017, this is where things started to get a little bit more odd. This is where people started to question the credibility of Sherry and her story. With a situation like this, you always want to believe the victim and especially with a descriptive story as Sherry's, it would be very wild if she were to actually make some of it up. There were some people that came out and was like, hey, this may be rude to say, but I actually don't think Sherry endured as much as she said she did. And obviously when people said that, it was an immediate like, how could you say that? That's really messed up to say because it is kind of really messed up to say. The woman that found Sherry, Allison, she was actually in an interview with the media to which she had said herself that the horror that she saw on 
Sherry's face that day was not something that you could just fake. It also came out that uh, Sherry was talking to a guy, James Reyes, although at this point his name was not made to the public. It was made known that she was talking to a guy prior to going missing. So people thought that this was kind of odd, but it wasn't until in 2017, a news outlet by the Sacramento Bee would do an article talking about Sherry. In this article was a lot of Sherry's behavior. Remember how I was talking earlier, like in her backstory that she would get into a lot of trouble. She had broken her sister's back door. She had hurt herself and said that she was going to blame it on her mother if her mother didn't follow her instruction. She had stole money from her father. The people that worked at church with Sherry said that she was very problematic. Just all the stuff I told you earlier is just now starting to come out to the public, making Sherry look even worse. Within this article, there was also a man by the name of Ken Ryan. Ken Ryan was actually a criminology professor as well as having plus 25 years experience in law enforcement. He said that it's very unlikely that the people who kidnapped and tortured Sherry were both women. Usually in this situation, it would always be men. And so it's definitely not impossible, obviously, but it is very odd. He also said that throughout his entire 25 years of working, he has never ever seen a kidnapping victim be released as quickly as Sherry was. Sherry was again kidnapped for 22 days, gone through the worst of the worst, and yet she was released and being interrogated just four days after coming home. This was very abrupt. This was very fast. How come she hasn't been involved over the past year? Why did it take a year to receive any sort of description of what her captors looked like? When this article was uploaded, it was immediately all over the place. It completely blew up. With this article, it encouraged a lot of people to dig a little bit deeper into Sherry. Reddit was actually the one that found a post made a couple years back by a woman named Sherry Grafe. Grafe is actually Sherry's maiden name and this post was made to a white supremacist forum, like a subreddit. This is very hard to read. It's very blood boiling, but I feel like it is important to let you know. I grew up in a small country town, Shasta Lake, California. My school is predominantly white. It was a small enough town that everyone pretty much knew each other. I was known as a really good athlete and my dad had a reputation for being my biggest fan, but also standing up against the Latinos. He even was often kicked out of the stands for getting into fights and defending himself when the Latinos would call him a Nazi. Seems that we are simply being of German descent was a constant irritant to them. I would get in fights too, having to stick up for myself instead of knuckling under to what the Latino girls, keywords, said and wanted. I got excellent grades okay? Grew more and more resentful of school and conditions around me. I used to come home in tears because I was getting suspended from school all the time for defending myself against the Latinos. The chief problem was that I was drug-free, white, and proud of my blood and heritage. That really irked a group of keyword again, Latino girls, which would constantly rag and attack me. One night at my volleyball game, my homecoming game, I spotted this, I'm not gonna say that, sitting behind my father. As the game was coming to an end, I kept seeing my dad snap around and look behind him, like he kept on getting hit by something. Then I caught out the corner of my eye, those, okay, throwing ice at my dad and mocking him by raising their hands in the air as if they were saluting Hitler. After the game was over and we shook hands with the other team, I walked up to the bleachers towards my dad. Just at that moment, he turned around. I told the Latinos, nicely actually, to quit their acting up. Then one of them called me Hitler, unleashed a barrage of profanity against me and my dad and took a swipe at me. That really teed me off. I don't 
think I've ever been that mad. I lunged back at her, slamming her head between the bleachers and pounding her face. It took three full-sized men to pull me off of her. I broke her nose and split her eyebrow. After they got me out of the gym, I had to deal with the cops and such. She did not press charges, so I was released to my father's custody. And it goes on and on. Obviously, I will not go on and on because that even just reading that makes me extremely uncomfortable because as you will see later, all of the outlandish stories and lies and things that she came up with and things that she did during her captivity. And so because of that, this 100% did not happen. If Sherry went to a predominantly white school and in a town where everybody knows everybody, I'm assuming her town was also predominantly white. She looks like everyone else. Why would she be singled out? Why would she specifically be singled out? Because she's German? 50% of the town is probably German. Just so many weird flexes in there that have nothing to do with the story. Like the fact that she has a 3.9 to 4.2 GPA that she was in sports at school. If anything, the people who aren't white are the ones that are being singled out and are the ones that are being made fun of. And even if you've just like talked to people that aren't white but went to predominantly white schools, they will tell you that they went through so many identity crises, so many different like identity issues because they didn't feel comfortable in their own skin. They didn't feel like they fit in. And so they instead hid themselves, they hid their personality, they hid their culture, they hid what makes them them because they were scared of what people were going to say. And that's extremely unfair and that's not right. You should be able to just enjoy the things that you want to enjoy openly. You should not change yourself to appeal other people. It's so frustrating because she clearly made this up for what? For literally nothing. And the fact that she's trying to play it off as if she did have those experiences or she had felt that way, it's so disrespectful to everyone who has actually felt like that and has actually been singled out in white predominant schools. Guys, let's move on because this woman's actually gonna give me high blood pressure if I talk about it anymore. And people just found it very odd, the similarities in that in this post, she was a white woman being aggressively attacked by Latin women and in her kidnapping story, she was again a white woman being attacked by Latin women. It was a very weird consistency with her story and people started to turn their backs on her because of this Reddit post. And not just because the validity in her story was kind of going down, but also because of the blatant racism that's in this post. Sherry's family, however, came out about this statement saying that it was not Sherry, it was just another Sherry Grafe and that her kidnapping was not racially motivated but it was because Sherry was young and petite and she was going to be entered into a sex trafficking ring and that is why she was kidnapped. It had nothing to do with race. The story just became 50-50 until March 3rd of 2022. Sherry was dropping off her kids at piano practice and she went inside, she dropped off her kids and all of a sudden a police officer came into the place and told Sherry, hey, I'm here because someone actually hit your car outside. I'm gonna need you to come with me. And so he takes Sherry outside, but when Sherry goes outside, she's confronted with four squad cars and she was being arrested. The police actually followed Sherry from her home all the way to the piano practice place. And then the police actually went inside and told Sherry to come outside purposefully because they didn't want the children to see their mother getting arrested. Obviously, that's a very traumatic thing to watch. But when Sherry was getting arrested, she was just all over the place. She was screaming. She was crying. She was kicking and throwing. She was telling the police not to arrest her, that she was innocent. She even threw her phone 20 feet away and cracked it. But due to all of this commotion outside, a lot of the teachers were watching through the window trying to see what was going on. And unfortunately, Sherry's children, Brandon and Olivia, also went up to the window to see what the teachers were looking at, and they ended up seeing their mother getting arrested anyway. Sherry's family actually came out about the situation and said that the way that Sherry was arrested was extremely unethical, and that if they wanted Sherry to come to the police station, they should have just told her and she would have complied and went to the station. Honestly, the only thing that made it unethical 
was Sherry kicking, screaming, and crying. She did not have to do that. She could have just held it in, got handcuffed, and went to the station. The police actually tried to do the right thing and make sure that her kids didn't see her getting arrested, but due to Sherry's outburst, her kids saw her getting arrested, which is exactly what the police were trying to avoid. Nonetheless, Sherry was indeed arrested that day, and she was charged with making false statements to federal law enforcement officers, as well as engaging in mail fraud. And the main thing that led to her arrest was that when they were testing the female and male DNA that was found on Sherry in day one, they actually found a match to the male DNA, and that DNA ironically matched up perfectly with Sherry's ex-boyfriend, James Reyes. And when James was brought into the station, he basically said, yeah, Sherry's kidnapping was fake. Nothing about it was real. It was all lies and she was actually staying at my house throughout her whole captivity and this is what happened. And so right then and there, he starts revealing everything. On November 2nd, Sherry went on her usual run that she typically goes on, but later that day, they had made plans to meet up. So James had picked up Sherry from her home. The two of them drove back to his home in Coast Mesa and that is where the two began to stay for the next three weeks. Sherry told James that she wanted to be with James but unfortunately she couldn't because she was married to Keith and they also had two kids together. She decided to make up a plan where she was going to pretend that she was kidnapped and that kidnapping story will hopefully buy her at least a month to spend time with James. James said that throughout the duration of the three weeks at first it really was just kind of you know puppy love. They were watching movies together they were hanging out together, but it wasn't until as the weeks pursued where Sherry started to get very scaringly involved with this kidnapping story that she was creating. And it was actually that day where she had convinced James to drive out to the forest preserve that she was jogging in earlier so she could leave her phone as well as a few pieces of her hair and her headphones in a very obvious place in the woods so that if someone were to come look for her, they would find that little piece of evidence. Sherry had convinced James to start physically and sexually abusing her so that the bruises and the scratches on her body would align with the kidnapping story that she was creating. And as time went on, the story of Sherry just got bigger and bigger. It was making national news. And so when Sherry found out that this was a very big story, she realized that she needed to create create a really big story to give to people. She even forced James to board up all of the windows in the home so that it looked like that Sherry was very malnourished and she wasn't getting any sort of sunlight. She then began to starve herself. She forced James to brand her. So that Exodus brand that was on her back was actually made by James. She told James to go out to Hobby Lobby and buy a wood burner and that's exactly what he did and he burned the word Exodus on her back. She even took one of James's rooms in his home and emptied it out and made it very dark and cold, just like the place that she was describing to the police. And she kept herself in there where she starved herself. She deprived herself of sleep. She deprived herself of sunlight. She would constantly make James punch her and hit her, as well as even herself constantly hurting herself. She did everything by the book to make it look like she was being kidnapped. So that's why when the police had found her, they were completely convinced that she was kidnapped. And the reasoning why Sherry put herself through all of this is really unknown. 22 days later on Thanksgiving, that's when Sherry realizes that, oh my God, wouldn't it be so cool if I came home on Thanksgiving? What a Thanksgiving gift. So on Thanksgiving, at 4 a.m. she and James, James had a friend that had a rental car company. So James went to his friend, he got a rental car, him and Sherry went in the rental car. And prior to getting into the rental car, James was the one that put the zip ties around Sherry's wrist, as well as putting chains around her waist that he just got from Home Depot. He then got a rental car and drove this rental car to a wooded area. And then it was there where Sherry got out of the car and just started running 
running surveillance footage that you saw earlier of her running across the parking lot and at that point that is when she was discovered by Allison Sutton and the trucker. And the car rental records as well as the odometer on the uh, car that he had rented out proved this to be right. It was around the same time frame as when it would happen and it was on the same day as Thanksgiving. James also said that weeks prior to her kidnapping she and him were in contact for many many weeks. They were contacting via prepaid cell phones so Keith would not find out. Since the police were actually able to find two prepaid cell phones, one of them in the area of Keith's home and then the other one in the area of Sherry's home and it was found that these two phones were only contacting with one another so it was obvious that this was Sherry's prepaid phone and this was Keith's prepaid phone. They also found through phone records and also cell tower analysis that on the day that Sherry went missing these two phones had come together in the middle of the day. James's cousin even came forward to the police and told police that he had seen Sherry twice at James's home during her disappearance. When the police asked James why he didn't come forward with this information in the first place to which James said that he would be willing to come forward to the police anytime the police asked him to but until then he was just gonna wait it out and see what happens and so that's exactly what he did for an entire six years after everything and he still kept that secret and didn't come to the police at all. After James says his story the police dig into James a little bit to see if what he's saying is true and they find that James was indeed telling the truth. They looked at James's work schedule and they found that he had taken off specifically November 1st and 2nd and Sherry went missing on November 2nd. He also had a lot of tardies at work. They also again found the car rental records and proved that James was indeed driving the car the day that Sherry went missing. Just everything about James's story felt very right and also had a lot of evidence to prove that it was right. And then so after they heard James's story, that is when they went to Sherry's home and then they followed Sherry from her home to the piano place that she was dropping off her kids at. The police waited until she was inside. They waited a couple minutes, assumed that Sherry had dropped them off. And that's when the police officer went in said you need to come outside and that is when Sherry got arrested. So Sherry is immediately taken into the interrogation room and at the top of the interview actually she is reminded by a law official that it is illegal to lie to law officials to which Sherry just nodded her head in agreement as if she understood that. So during this interview actually Sherry is sitting beside Keith. Keith is right next to her throughout this entire thing and the police waste absolutely no time to show Sherry what she's in there for. So the police start talking about her captivity and that's when the police tell her, oh, well, you know, we might have found the place of where you have been held captive. And so she kept on saying that she was in this house. So that is when the police started to lay down pictures of James's house. They assume that, you know, maybe when Sherry sees these pictures of James's home, she's going to get scared. She's going to get nervous because she's been caught up with. She basically just looked at them so casually. There was no shock shock, no fear in her face. And she simply just said, quote, they look very similar, but it's not an exact match. Sherry, as a kidnapping victim, tells the police that if the reason they brought her into the station was to interrogate her about the finding of her abductors, they should just stop looking for her abductors because she's actually grateful for her abductors. She's grateful because without her abductors, she would have never made it home safely. When she says that, the police, again, right off the bat, they don't waste any time. They're like, we're actually not looking for your abductors anymore because your abductors don't exist. And that's when they start to tell Sherry about everything that James had told them and said, James came in, he confessed to everything. We know you're guilty. We know what happened. We have the evidence to prove so. To this, obviously, Sherry is defensive. She says, no, that's not right. You got it all wrong. I was actually kidnapped. None of this happened. I am the victim here. This is not right. Keith is still in the room. And so at this point, Keith just gets up and walks out of the room. I'm assuming because he's in shock 
shock at all of this evidence that's being presented to him. And the fact that Keith just stood by Sherry's side through everything, listened to all her stories, gave her therapy, gave her love, gave her time to heal, and knowing that none of that happened. And when Keith leaves the room, that is when Sherry starts to open up to the police a little bit more. She says that she did indeed cheat on Keith with James, and she also cheated on Keith with multiple other men as well, but she's very, very regretful of her actions and it will never happen again. But the police also tell her that she is actually not the only one who might be criminally charged, but Keith might also be criminally charged. You may remember in the very, very beginning of the episode when I was talking about the GoFundMe, they had made $56,000 off of that GoFundMe. Now, two weeks after Sherry returned home, two weeks after Thanksgiving, Keith had wrote a check for $31,808 from the GoFundMe's bank account to his personal bank account. And then right after that, he wrote a second check for $1,106 and deposited that directly into Sherry's bank account. On December 13th, 2016, so a month after Sherry returns home, Keith had spent $8,202 of the GoFundMe money to pay off his personal credit cards and Sherry did the same exact thing and she took $3,053 to pay off her personal debts with the GoFundMe money. The remaining $11,000 was proved to be used by personal expenses by the family, but that doesn't stop there because that isn't the only fraud that they had committed. Sherry had actually applied for the California Victims Compensation Board, which is basically an organization that gives financial, emotional, supportive, health to victims of violent crimes. Sherry actually applied and got accepted for financial assistance. And over the next four years, she had gotten over $30,000 from this organization. A CNN article actually added up everything that she owed to the government. Penny's alleged fraud disappearance was not without consequences to others. It cost upwards to $230,000 and countless hours of manpower, according to officials. Ultimately, the investigation revealed that there was no kidnapping. U.S. Attorney Philip A. said to the DAG News release, quote, and that time and resources could have been used to investigate actual crime, protect the community, and provide resources to victims were wasted based upon the defendant's conduct. So essentially, they're saying that she owed $230,000 to the government and all of those resources of finding Sherry, trying to locate Sherry, and even the $30,000 that she had gotten from the California organization, that money could have been used to actual victims of violent crimes. She was an innocent person that had endured nothing and still got money from people out of pity and sympathy. After her interrogation, she was weirdly given bail and her bail was set at $120,000, but it came with requirements. The requirements included that she had to surrender her passport to law officials. She had to agree to not leave certain parts of California. She had to hand over all weapons because she did own guns in the household. She was going to be given drug and alcohol tests frequently, so that means no drugs or alcohol. She needed to participate in a psychiatric program. She was actually able to meet all of these requirements and she was released out on bail. Obviously, this was a very, very big surprise, but nonetheless, she was released out on bail. And then on April 13th of 2022, so last year, Sherry actually had a statement that read, quote, I am deeply ashamed of myself for my behavior and so sorry for the pain I have caused all my family, my friends, all the good people who needlessly suffered because of my story and those who worked so hard to try to help me. I will work the rest of my life to make amends for what I have done. Now that I have learned the truth as reflected in the plea arrangement. Keith also made a statement that read, quote, I must act decisively to protect my children from the trauma caused
caused by their mother and bring stability and calm to their lives. I wish to make it clear that my goal is to provide a loving, safe, stable environment for Brandon and Olivia. I believe the requested orders are consistent with that goal and the best interest of the children. He did not want to say anything about Sherry's case that would, quote, inflame the situation or attract media attention. On April 16th of 2022, that is when Sherry had actually accepted a plea deal and pled guilty. And she also admitted to orchestrating her kidnapping, her whole entire kidnapping, her whole entire kidnapping story, that whole two hour long interrogation that I just showed you earlier was all fake. Her tears were fake. None of that happened when she was talking about getting picked up, when she was talking about her time in captivity. She said that there was never any Latin women that come to pick her up and those sketches were simply just people that she had made up in her head. That's why they were wearing masks because she didn't want to get too specific with it. And then on April 22nd of 2022, that is when Keith had filed for a divorce and ended up winning full custody of both Brandon and Olivia. And then in September of 2022, that is when Sherry's trial began. She pled guilty to the charges of 34 counts of mail fraud and one count of making false statements to law enforcement and was sentenced to 18 months in prison plus a $309,000 fine. Right after her trial, the U.S. Attorney's Office of California put out a statement saying, quote, eventually the evidence showed that Papini's story was carefully planned. False story. DNA, cell phone, and car rental evidence proved that she had been voluntarily staying with a former boyfriend and that she had harmed herself to support her false statements. On October 13th of 2020, an FBI special agent and detective from the Shasta County Sheriff's Office met with Papini. At the outset of the meeting, they told Papini it was a crime to lie to federal agents. Papini continued to claim that she was kidnapped. Later in the interview, Papini was again warned that it was a crime to lie to federal agents and told about the DNA and the telephone evidence showing that she had been with her former boyfriend. Yet, even after this second warning and provided evidence, Papini continued to make false statements. So it seems like even though she was being shown all of this evidence, all of this clear, you know, signs that she was lying, she still goes with her story. And as of today in 2023, Sherry is currently 40 years old and she is serving her time at the Federal Correctional Institution Victorsville, a medium security federal prison and is due to be released next year in the year of 2024, March 2024, at the age of 42 years old. As far as Keith, um, I couldn't really find if Keith ever got charged with the mail fraud of like, taking money out of the GoFundMe bank account and using it for his personal expenses. As of what I can see, it seems like he didn't because there has been photos of Keith out and about with his kids. He tends to be a very private person. He doesn't talk to the media. He doesn't talk to anyone. It's just him and his kids, really. From the very beginning, you start to really feel for Sherry and then you see who Sherry was behind the curtain and who she was as a person. And it just immediately, just makes you feel so terrible for feeling pity for her or feeling bad for her. And I understand that, you know, the reason of her doing this was probably because of some mental illness that she had, some deteriorating mental illness, because no completely sane and, you know, sounded mind person would do something like this. But that still does not excuse why James was still on in the entire situation. James, for 22 days, had the option to say, no, let's not do this and turn her into the police. I mean, he was watching the news like everyone else. He was looking at the missing persons posters like everyone else, yet he did nothing. So I feel like, you know, both is to blame at this point. And even way after when Sherry came home, Sherry got convicted four years after she was kidnapped. That gave her four years to go to therapy, figure out what she did and why what she did was wrong and turn herself into the police. Yet she did none of that. And she continued to pursue this story for four years. Nonetheless, that is the end of today 
today's story. If you guys found this story interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And if you want to follow me on any of my socials, like my Instagram, that will be linked down below, as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And as well as well, all of the makeup that I put on my face. So if you're wondering, you know, what is that lip? What is that shadow? That will all be linked down below, as well as well as well, all of the research that I use for this case. So if, you know, you want to watch the interrogation, that will be linked down below. All of the articles that I mentioned, all of the documentaries that I mentioned, all will be linked down below. And even if you do go ahead and do your own research about the case, if you find something in your research that I didn't find in mine or that I didn't mention, make sure to leave that in the comments below because I'm pretty sure everyone here will be very interested to hear what you have to say. As for my own personal thoughts and opinions, I already said most of my personal thoughts and opinions as we were going along. It's completely normal to feel frustrated and angry. The fact that Sherry would targets just an innocent group of people that were her captors and would give fake, you know, descriptions. And it's just so, so scary to think that since she gave such a vague description, the probability of someone to be wrongfully convicted for Sherry's lies, I think that's what makes this so much more scary and so much more frustrating. But I'm also very, very grateful that nobody was charged, that nobody went to trial with this. Because if they did, then that means Sherry would still just be out and about talking about her story as if it was true while an innocent woman sits in jail for Sherry's lies. Unfortunately, a lot of people were hurt in this situation, including Keith and the children. There is so much more that I could say about this story, honestly, but I would just be talking forever. I would love to hear what you guys think about the situation, including Sherry's like 18 month joke of a prison sentence. Would love to hear what you guys think about that in the comments below. Do you think she should have gotten longer? Do you think that James is just as in the wrong as Sherry is? Or do you think that Sherry was able to manipulate James into doing things that she told him to do? As for the look today, I definitely went for a very like 70s look today with the earrings and the eyeshadow. I've just been really obsessed with like 70s flower child era. I don't know what it is, but that's just been my vibe recently. Recently. That is all from me. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your morning, day, night, wherever you're watching this. Make sure to be safe out there. Go outside today, get some fresh air, even if it's like raining or something. Open up the window, get some of that fresh air, hang out with your friends, tell someone you love them today, even if that someone is yourself. And with that being said, we'll see you guys next week. And I love you, I love you, I love you. And do something that makes you happy today.